So. I have done this story, Arthur and the Action Agency, already on my channel. So. I will. If you haven't read it, don't look at the answers. And of course now, all of the cars have decided to drive past the window. So here we have Agent Arthur on the stormy seas. Arthur's second mission. So we will have a code again. I have a pen and paper here ready and I remembered that I'm going to write out everything this time. So, because last time it was going backwards and forwards and it was a, it was a bit of a mess. So, Arthur's second mission. So we have, Lady has a sign here that says missing ships. Turn turtle, rust bucket, sea spray, barnacle. And it says Captain S. Kipper. As in Skipper. Port Pacamac Harbor Master. So we have this guy with a hat saying, Have you heard? Another ship disappeared yesterday. And we have this guy. It's the ghost of Pirate Captain Cutlass that's sinking the ships. Mark my word. Immediately we have a memo, so immediately I will be pulling out my paper, but I will actually have a little read first. So, following the success of his first mission, Arthur was smiling broadly as he stepped out of the jungle and into the busy streets of Port Pacama. He had been sent there by Uncle Jake, the founder of the agency. This looks like a relaxing place, Arthur whispered to his faithful companion Sleuth. No signs of our arch enemies, the spider organization. We've seen the last of them, I'm sure. Dodging past local sea captains and ducking flying missiles, Arthur made his way down to the harbour. He stared hard at the vital agency information that he had been given and tried to keep his eyes peeled and ears open. Remember, an action agent should always be on the alert, he said to Sleuth. You never know when we might have to put our finely tuned skills into action. So this time the memo and the code are on the same place, but I'm still going to write a note. So. We're going anti-clockwise, so this is a question cross is B, Yen is C, not equal to is D, this is E, F, oh no, G, H. 
in the jungle, the mighty jungle. Uh, he And I guess it says emergency. Emergency action A e. Infinity G E N T S An emergency ac action agents In emergency action, agents may transmit in simple code. And this is zero to full stop, so A L L S E A up. No, that's the cross. Seaborn A G E N D S A C this
In emergency action, agents may transmit in simple code. All seaborne agents active in this area must carry a black and red identification flag. I don't see anyone with a black and red identification flag. Also, what's this guy doing? Oh. Is this another one or is this where we... There's another one. Okay. Two in the first two cages. Okay. So that and I don't need to move because I've got this. Yay. Hey. Ah, no, I don't. Because this one's going clockwise. Oh no, I don't. Funny because isn't Omega the last letter of the Greek alphabet? This ring is getting better and better. like that.
guess that was what was in the last one, but it's not. N D E R. Now what's this one again? I N N. E D I S A B B E A R A N C E So, join the crew of the Flounder. Investigate the disappearance of ships in this area and prevent further incidents. Well, I didn't even read the story first, I just went straight for the note. Let's get to the story, shall we? Arthur sat down in a crumbling quayside cafe. He ordered his favourite tutti-frutti cocktail and gazed over Pacamac Bay. Despite what he had heard about ships disappearing, everything seemed normal. Uncle Jake must have thought we deserved a holiday, he said to Sleuth, who opened one eye then fell asleep again. Arthur leant back and closed his eyes. He dreamt he was on a beach, and all was quiet except for footsteps approaching, then retreating into the distance. Arthur woke up with a start, blinking in the sunlight. He looked down at the table. 
his drink had arrived, along with a grubby envelope. Sleuth snored quietly on, while Arthur glanced around. There was no sign of this silent messenger. Arthur ripped open the envelope. Inside he found a piece of paper covered with instantly recognisable symbols. It was a message from the action agency. So we found says what does the message say? Join the crew of the Flounder, investigate the disappearance of ships in this area and prevent further incidents. Do you think it was this guy? Kind of looks like Jake is running and knocking over things. Arthur spotted. I have no sense to see how many pages. This one's 40 pages long. Whew. Arthur spotted the flounder, a three masted schooner, schooner. I'm gonna say schooner, it sounds familiar. Moored at the far side of the port, he dashed over to it. The captain smiled and took Arthur as a deck, on as a deck. Introductions were hardly over before the captain boomed out orders to weigh anchor and cast off. This guy says, I'm Captain Tor, and these are the twins, Jim and Kate. Pleased to have you aboard, shipmate. We'll keep a low profile, whispered Arthur, as they set sail into the white blue yonder and act like old sea dogs. Day two, grub up. Bangers and mash. But Arthur's stomach had different ideas. While Sleuth scampered round happily, Arthur struggled to find his sea legs. Arthur eventually got used to the motion of the ship, but there was hardly time to rest as the captain ordered all hands on deck to learn ship safety. He's here he is saying the rescue signals three short flashes, three long flashes, three short flashes. Funny quick side note is uh, we didn't the unlock escape game, I think I might have mentioned it. And there was one of the puzzles where you had to do Morse code and my sister was kind of doing it but she was failing miserably. And I did it and I got it. It's just, I know that's, that's what it is. I was, it was driving me mad. <laughs> anyway. So much for a holiday, said Arthur, trying to concentrate on the ship's emergency drill. For the first week, the flounder made good progress, sailing at full speed with a stiff breeze behind her. Arthur learnt to steer as Captain Tar plotted their course through squalls, showers and schools of dolphins. Steady as she goes. During the second week at sea, Kate spotted a dot on the horizon and shouted, Land ahoy! Hey, this guy looks familiar. Looks like the bad guy from the last one. The crew anchored the boat and stepped onto a jetty. While Captain Tar traded some of the cargo, the others tried to get back their land legs. Hmm. I'm looking here and wondering. That was my arm on the table. The following night, Captain Tar gathered the crew together and told them a strange story. Ships disappear mysteriously in these waters, he said. Some say the ghost ship of pirate Captain Cutlass still sails the seas looking for victims. This must be. On the third day's sail from the island, the wind died away. The sea became dead calm and the sails hung limply. Yo, and a bottle of rum. And everyone's dreaming of ice cream, cocktails, and... Is it so sunny? Arthur, Jim and Kate could only doze and dream as the air became hot and heavy, but Captain Tar didn't seem to mind. They were still becalmed next morning when Arthur's night watch finished. Arthur was about to turn in when he saw Captain Tar tap the barometer uneasily. Hope those clouds don't mean trouble, yawned Arthur as he headed below decks. Arthur and Sleuth snoozed fitfully while the wind howled and waves broke against the porthole. The flounder sailed on as flashes of lightning streaked down from the dark clouds onto the sea. 
Suddenly the ship listed over to port. Arthur and Sleuth flew out of their bunk and hit the deck. Arthur picked himself up and desperately scrambled into his waterproofs. He and Jim dashed out of the cabin. Up on deck, Kate and the captain were struggling with the wheel, trying to turn the ship to face the next wave. But it was too late. An enormous wave raced towards the flounder. It towered high above the ship for a second, then broke over the prow. Tons of salty water streamed across the deck, slamming into the crew. Help, says someone. Don't panic, says the other. The flounder rolled and dipped under the weight of the water, then slowly rose. The main mast had snapped like a twig and the sails were in tatters. Abandoned ship, says Captain Tar. Captain Tar roared orders above the gale as the crew clung on for dear life. Jim cut through the lashings, holding the life raft. Captain Tar pulled a ripcord to inflate it. More waves crashed broadside into the stricken ship as Kate and Arthur scrambled below deck. Water was pouring into the cabin as Kate grabbed vital equipment. Arthur tried the radio. It was dead. Arthur yanked open a drawer in the captain's desk and grabbed the logbook, a map and a note. Arthur noticed something strange. The note was in code, but he only had time to glance at it before stuffing it into a pocket. What does it say? Hmm. Seems like it's. I don't know, that looks like it says emergency. I use the clip because I'm terrible. Boy, tired. Clear. This, oh no. yeah. this is not simple until you get the hang of it. First think backwards, then try swapping the last letter of the first word with the last letter of the next word. Okay. So swap. Here, emergency. Hurricane. Skull and crossbones are to no are ordered to run for cover or regroup or regroup at rope. Roboroba Island Flying Correct Identification Flag So it needs to be black and red That was a tricky one <laughs> Arthur struggled out of the cabin and joined the others up on deck He clung on to the guardrail as the ship rolled and pitched unsteadily the life raft was already floating on the churning sea. Kate got ready to join Jim aboard the raft. Clutching her equipment bag tightly, she leapt over the side. Arthur gulped. It was his turn now. He picked up Sleuth and looked over. The raft bounced up and down in the heavy swell, banging against the flounder's hull and drifting away. It's all in the timing, thought Arthur, just as a gust of wind blew him off the ship and into the inflatable. Kate untangled herself from the others and stared at the flounder. Something was wrong. The mooring rope snapped, she gasped. As they helplessly watched, the captain drift away. Jim realised the raft was taking in water. They had to bail it out, and fast. Five hours later, the hurricane had blown itself out and the raft was floating in the calm sea. 
Arthur opened the door flap and stared around. There was water, water everywhere, but no sign of the flounder or of Captain Tar. Sleuth's Sleuth growled at a shark, and Arthur's mind raced back to his shipwreck survival course. They must try to pinpoint their position to see if they were near land. Jim checked the compass while Arthur studied the flounder's logbook. Kate noticed they were drifting in a current. Arthur thought hard and picked up the chart. Now he could work out where they were. Where are they? So, left easternmost of the six Wahoyan Islands and set sailed southeast. Made good progress and sailed southeast around island in our path. Changed direction and sailed 25 miles due south before we became becalmed. Drifted 25 miles west during the night. Hurricane warning. Wind coming from the north. Estimate it will blow us 45 miles an hour. Okay, I need to kind of use that. Changed direction and sailed 25 miles south, so they're about here. Drifted 25 miles west to about here. 45 miles an hour. So, and they were five hours, so one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. So, this should be here. How many hours were they actually? Five hours. They're about here. I think. I think. During the damp and cramped night, Arthur decided to tell the twins about the action agency and to enlist their help on his mission. They listened in amazement and eagerly agreed to become apprentice action agents. As dawn broke, Arthur spotted low clouds on the horizon. Just then, a seabird landed by the raft. Coming from the north. Yeah. <laughs> Sleuth licked his lips, hopefully, while Arthur's brain whirred and clicked. Could this sound mean land ahead? Jim and Kate whooped happily at the thought and began paddling. So we see. Arthur picked up his all-weather, extra-tough, mega-magnifying action agency issue binoculars and scanned the horizon. A coral island zoomed into focus. Land ahoy, he shouted. Kate and Jim went into overpaddle. The raft raced along until Kate heard a rip and a hissing sound. They were punctured. Arthur blew into the flotation chamber while the others tried to steer towards the island, avoiding more coral. But it was no good. Despite all their efforts, they were still deflating fast. Abandon ship, panted Arthur. They floated out of the raft and half swimming, half wading, dragged themselves ashore. Save at last, gasped Jim, collapsing on the beach. We're alone on a deserted island. Maybe we're not, said Kate. What has Kate spotted? So there's a set for this guy. Set for her, set for him, but then there's a set of actual footprints. Following the footprints, Arthur bent over to examine the footprints while Sleuth growled suspiciously at them. They were human, but were they friendly? The footprints led up the beach and disappeared into the dense undergrowth. Hmm, size 12, man. Let's follow them, said Jim. They may lead to civilization. Sleuth can sniff the way Arthur replied. We'll follow, but stay alert. A padded screeched. It was quite disgruntled, I guess. A padded screeched overhead as the trio tramped uphill behind Sleuth, their mouths watering at the delicious looking tropical fruits all around. A few minutes later, Sleuth barked angrily. The trail ended abruptly at a pool of water and a waterfall. Kate rested her sore feet while Jim wondered what they should do next. Arthur looked up. Whoever had made the trail of footprints must have swum across the pool and climbed the cliff opposite. After telling the twins to carry on searching, 
Arthur waded through the shallow water at the edge of the pool and began scrambling up the rock. Trying not to look down, he gradually left Jim and Kate far behind. It was a long, hot climb, but at last Arthur reached the top. Once he had got his breath back, he wiped the sweat from his eyes and scanned the island, hoping to see some trace of civilization or even of Captain Tar. But there was no sign of human life, only a seabird that flapped its wings and gazed curiously back at him. Arthur slumped down dejectedly beside Sleuth. He wondered what they should do next. They didn't want to be stuck on a desert island. Back at the pool, Kate explored the waterfall but found nothing. She was swimming back when Jim spotted a scrap of paper. He picked it up and realised it was written in code. I think it describes a trail, he shouted. If we follow it, we might find help. Or pirate treasure, Kate added hopefully. But where can we pick it up? Where can they join the train? If we do it the same as before, it doesn't work. I'm seeing sort of like if Buccaneer Beach. Oh, there's an extra eye in each word. There's too many eyes in each word. From Buccaneer Beach, head for Skull Rock. Then go east through the jungle to Golden Beach. Buddy. Buddy Luke. Buddy loot six feet under the eagle rock. Bones and baddies. Arthur paced around the cliff top, flicking through his agency handbook for the chapter on shipwrecked sailors. He was concentrating so hard that he didn't hear Sleuth's warning bark until it was too late. Arthur found himself falling through the air. He stopped. He tried to stop his fall by grabbing hold of an overhanging vine, but it snapped off in his hand. Arthur plummeted towards the ground, hoping for a soft landing. He looked down at the jungle below and crashed head first through the roof of an old hut, half hidden amongst the thick trees and bushes. Arthur slowly opened his eyes, he looked up and wished that he hadn't. His hair stood on end, then everything went black. That's nice. Meanwhile, Kate and Jim were following the trail. Jim spotted two people ahead. He was about to rush up to them when Kate stopped him. I don't like the sound of what they're saying, she whispered. Let's stay hidden. Jim nodded and stepped back onto a dry twig. It cracked loudly. Kate and Jim froze in horror, then turned to run. But it was too late. Before they could escape, they felt, they felt hands on their shoulders and unfriendly faces stared at them. At that moment, Sleuth licked Arthur back to consciousness. Arthur was about to race out of the hut when the remains of an old document caught his eye. He began fitting the bits together and working out the writing. What a find, thought Arthur, carefully tucking the pieces into his bulging bag. I must show this to Jim and Kate. What does the document say? Okay. Hard to see where it goes together. This is top right. Okay, so this must be the top. Or this will be the That's not the top. That may be the top. After a bloody struggle, our hip ship was captured by the dreaded pirate Captain Cutlass. I was filled with gloom as we were taken inside his infamous lair. Out by hand from the cliff. I escaped 
the sharks. Oh, this must be first, actually. I escaped the sharks and reached this island, but I am ravaged by a tropical fever and fear that I will never see home again. Bolton, Bolson boat from the good ship, the river Hind. Gosh. There seemed to be no escape from this hateful place. During months of forced labor until by chance I overheard a mention of a secret tunnel leading to the shore. After weeks of searching, I discovered the entrance. Disguised as a pirate, I sped through the tunnel until at last I breathed the fresh air of freedom to enter the tunnel from the shore. Press the third eye of the tall queen's right hand guard. I think I read it in the right order. Oh wow. <laughs> Puzzles. The razor sharp briefs. Arthur was heading back towards the waterfall when Sleuth sniffed the air and growled. Arthur glimpsed movement on the beach. He looked closer and gasped. Jim and Kate were being pushed into a rowing boat. Arthur raced down through the trees and thick bushes to the beach. He stared across the lagoon. The twins were being taken towards a rusty old tug boat. A rusty old tug boat. Sleuth sniffed at a scrap of blue paper and gave it to Arthur. There is no, this is no time to pick up litter, hissed Arthur, putting it in his pocket. We must find a way through the razor sharp coral to that tug. Can Arthur find a safe route to the boat? No, next page. <laughs> He is here. Well, I mean, they're going that way, but that doesn't exactly look safe. So, go through. Up here. I mean, up here. Here, past. There, climb over the rock. Up here. Behind here. Through this little gap here. Of trouble. Arthur trod water and oil as he tried to fathom out a way aboard the old tug. Clever fathom. He heaved himself out of the water to reach a porthole on the side of the ship, but he couldn't make it. Then Arthur had a flash of inspiration and swam over to the slimy anchor chain. He hoisted himself up, limp he hoisted himself up, link by slippery link until at last he clambered over the side of the ship. He landed on the deck and hit and hid behind a battered funnel. He peered out and saw the twins being led below decks by two mean-looking villains. Who were these crooks? Why had they kidnapped Jim and Kate? Arthur turned to Sleuth, but he wasn't there. Arthur looked back over the side and spotted a dorsal fin. He threw Sleuth a line and hauled him up just in time. Sleuth collapsed in a damp puddle and the tug set sail. Hours later the boat was echoing to the sound of snoring as the stowaways crept out from behind the funnel. Arthur stared inside the wheelhouse trying to find Jim and Kate. Then he tiptoed below decks to check out the crew's quarters. Arthur followed his nose and peered inside the galley. And peered in at the galley. He left quickly. Sleuth led the way down to another deck and growled outside a steel door. Kate and Jim were in the cabin ahead. They seemed to be all right, but they were well guarded. Just then, Arthur heard footsteps coming their way. He stared around in horror, then dived through an open door into the engine room. Arthur hid behind the steamy old engine and strained to hear the muffled conversation outside. His heart sank as he heard the key click in the lock. He was trapped. Arthur looked around the grimy room and spurred himself into action. There must be a way out and he was going to find it. Is there a way out? See, that says you should leave the key in the lock. So does that mean he did? Does that mean he didn't? Where is the door? Is it this door? Because they're speaking.
Must be this door, because there's a keyhole. It's a padlock. So. Ah. So if you just put something under, like, this newspaper or cloth or something, put it on there, and then use this screwdriver to poke through the keyhole, and then you'll poke the key out. And you can pull back the cloth underneath and then the key should be on top. A ghostly galleon. It was dark when Arthur managed to open the door and he crept silently above decks. The ship was moored in a lagoon. The moon was shining and mist rose off the sea. In the distance Arthur spotted Jim and Kate being rowed towards an island. Just then, Sleuth's hackles rose as a faint chugging noise drifted over the water. Suddenly, an old sailing ship appeared through the mist. Arthur stared wide-eyed at the tattered sails, the skull and crossbones, and the ghostly crew. H -h help He quavered, his hair standing on end. Arthur remembered Captain Tar's story and turned white. His agency training hadn't covered spooky spectres, and this looked very much like the ghostly galleon of Pirate Captain Cutlass. Is it? Kinda looks like Captain Tar to me. I don't know. Can't be. By the time Arthur's teeth stopped chattering, the fake ghosts had changed course for the island that the twins had been taken to. Were the kidnappers in league with the creepy crew? There was only one possible way to find out. You'll follow them, Arthur said, loading a sailboard into the water. Hang on, Sleuth. Dawn was breaking when Sleuth opened his eyes again. Arthur windsurfed unsteadily round a, round a headland and gasped. He spotted the twins. They were inside a cage being winched up a fortress-like cliff. Arthur stared in amazement and thought back to the mem of bows and bones. This was the entrance to Captain Cutlass's pirate lair. Arthur swung the sail round, regained his balance, and headed for dry land. At last he beached the board out of sight of the villains. Sleuth bounded happily onto solid ground and scampered round the huge stone heads that were scattered along the shore. I must try to rescue Jim and Kate and find out what these crooks, crooks are up to, Arthur thought. But the front entrance is impregnable. If there's a way, if only there's a way back in. If only there's a back way in. Arthur began scrambling up the steep hill for a better view of the base. Suddenly he tripped over the overgrown head of a fallen statue. As he picked himself up, his memory jolted into gear and he reached for Boson's Bones memoirs. Maybe there was a way into the base after all. How can Arthur get in? There was something about an eye. Uh, from the shore press the third eye of the tall queen's right hand card. Okay, third eye of the tall queen, because she must be the queen. Hand card. Must be this one. Third eye of the tall queen's hand card. This. She's, this one's a card. This is the tall queen. Hand. There we go. Third eye. Arthur climbed the head and pressed the eye. There was a grinding sound below and a stone slab slid open. Arthur shone his torch into the blackness and the air was full of dark flying shapes. Arthur fought off the bats and he and Sleuth headed into the tunnel. Water dripped from the ceiling and their footsteps echoed off the stone walls as they crept slowly uphill. Suddenly Arthur stopped. Ahead he spotted a light at the end of the tunnel. Arthur and Sleuth cautiously scrambled over fallen stones, peered through the hole and gasped. The cave in front of them was crammed full of radar screens and high-tech tracking equipment. But there was no trace of Kate and Jim. 
or any other sign of life. What was going on? Sleuth was first out of the tunnel and into the cave. He sniffed the air, then listened out by the door. Arthur picked up some photos on a desk. He stared hard at them. His brain whirred as he spotted the two kidnappers, the fake ghost ship and its crew. Arthur immediately recognised the names of the boats in the photos. That solved the mystery of the missing ships. Arthur smiled grimly. The first part of his mission was complete. Now to find out more about these modern day pirates. Who was behind the villains? And what was their next target? Just then, a printer chattered into life. Arthur hardly had time to memorise the coded type before Sleuth growled. Seconds later, the door opened and a familiar figure walked in. Arthur peered at the pirate. If she was here, the twins must be nearby. But before Arthur started searching for them, he tried to decode the message. It might answer some questions. I think use every second word or something. Organization and Max. Patch the we know for ship. Hmm. It will sail between the islands. Between the graveyard. Island peaks. Twin peaks. Reaching the northernmost of the needles here. If you will turn it, we'll turn it northwest ahead of level until It seems like some of the words are supposed to be to spider organization. Mangler and Max. Eye patch. Spider to organization. Max, Mangler, and I patch the lil. We have the route for target ship. Next ship target. Next target ship, something. The flying fish. It will sail between the southwest ships and Graveyard Island. Reaching the Twin Peaks, northernmost of the... It's taking too long, so... Needles, three year, three turns of the needles that will head northwest and until we'll level with the most easternmost island, then the archipelago, diamond cruise, it will go south, to south, between Shark Island and Volcano, then out of our territory, if an emergency occurs, use JPX escape plan. So I've got the route of the flying fish. Plot attack course for the killer whale G6, F6, E6, E5, E4, E3. Okay. So how does it normally start? Oh, here. So, G6. No, G6. F6. E6. E5, E4, E3. So it goes along here and it's a little shape. And then we have the other one. This is between the graveyard ships, the south, west, or something. Now the graveyard ships. So it's going to sail, it sounds like it's going to sail from like here and then go north to the three needles or something which means it would cross like here because we go there and this goes like up to three needles so something like that sometimes i think that this makes perfect sense like in the last one but in this one i 
don't think it makes perfect sense at all. So, take him to the hall. Run, Sleuth. He's coming round. Yeah, it's like a god. Arthur's mind groggily drifted in and out of consciousness. Hold on. Oh. Arthur studied the map. As he did so, he heard a hissing noise behind him. His head began to swim as he slumped to the floor. So they've got some sort of gas. And he expects me to figure that out. I feel like I've been out with that gas right now. Arthur's mind groggily drifted in and out of consciousness. As he tried to fight his way out of the drug-induced sleep, images of what had happened filtered through to him. He dimly remembered faces and being moved out of the cave. But who were the strange people looking down at him, and where was he now? Arthur blinked again at the two blurs staring at him. Kate and Jim suddenly appeared. They explained the situation, and Arthur's mind snapped back into action. He heard a strange noise coming from the porthole. Good work, whispered Arthur as a bedraggled sleuth squeezed into the cabin. Bite through our ropes and we'll try and find a way up on deck. From there we might be able to escape. How can they get up on deck? Where are they? Here. Oh, this is fun. I like doing now I might actually be able to get somewhere. So down, through the door, up. And then they can open the door on for the others. Uh, stairs here, door here, stairs here. That's it? That was really easy. Or maybe you can't go through there. But then there's there. And then they can, no they can't go that way. Oh, they can't go here because this guy's guarding it. So they need to find a way of getting up on deck without being spotted. Okay, so they go through here. There's a door here, door here. No, I can't go that way. And there's something in the way here. <laughs> this part of the ship because we can't see anything. Oh, so, can't go up that way. Go down, up, through, climb through the hole in the deck. are turned. Arthur was first up on deck. He hid behind the capstan. Oh, that's where we came out, so that's good. As the twins scrambled out of the hatch behind him. You must keep quiet until the coast is clear, whispered Arthur. Once the pirates have gone below, we will try to take a boat and reach the flying fish before it's attacked. They heard laughter from the deck below and peered round the mast. Kate clenched her fists at what she saw. Those are the crews of the captured ships, she said. We can't leave them as prisoners. Kate was right, but there were only three of them against the pirates. Arthur gritted his teeth. He was an action agent. There was only one thing to do. Charge, yelled Arthur, grabbing a rope and swinging into a crowd of pirates. The twins followed up with a battle. The pirates were so surprised that they hardly had time to react before the captured crews joined in on Arthur's side. They soon turned the tables on the dastardly pirate crew. As the villains were taken below, Arthur looked back at the island. No one had raised the alarm. Arthur began to grin, but it faded when he checked the time. So, the sea spray's engine can reach 12 knots an hour. But with 
has a good wind like today, full sail she can do a quarter as much as it can. So, so we got 15. And 15 times 6 is 90. Because 15 times 2 is 30, and then times that by 3. I was just going to leave that one to last because it's the most difficult song. There we go. At least I know immediately that I got the answer right. Jim and Kate helped Arthur aboard the sea spray. Kate went below to start the engine and the motley crew sprang into action. Arthur pulled out his agency compass and grabbed the rudder. Jim pumped out the bilges while Sleuth tried to hoist the sails. Wishing that Captain Tar was there to help, Arthur steered a course through the choppy water. Kate left the engine and acted as lookout. They made good headway despite heavy seas. After five hours rolling and pitching, Kate spotted something on the horizon. Look out, she yelled. It's a water spout. I'm sure she didn't mean to ring. Arthur's blood froze as the column of water raced towards them. There was no escape. Gale forced wind blast gale force winds blasted around them and they were sucked into the whirling water spout. Arthur felt himself being lifted up, spun round and round, then hurled deep into the water. His head was spinning and his lungs were bursting as he swam up to the surface. At last his head broke through the water and he gulped down fresh air. Still gasping for breath he tried to think. Even his action agency training hadn't covered this situation. Arthur spotted Sleuth floating amongst the remains of the boat. As Sleuth clung onto Arthur's equipment bag, Jim and Kate swam over towards them. Arthur saw a large piece of wreckage floating nearby and sputtered out orders to the other. Get aboard the wreckage, we'll use it as a raft. We're in a bad way, Arthur muttered, clambering on the make onto the makeshift raft. No food, no water, no sign of help. Just then, Kate shouted, ship ahoy, and pointed to a dot on the horizon. The crew jumped up and down waving, but it was no good. The ship kept going. The ship kept going. Arthur emptied out his bag and thought back to Captain Tar's emergency signals. If only he could remember the correct signals and find something to signal with. What can they use to signal this? What signals should they use? It's three, three long, three short, three long. Or is it three short, three long? I can't remember if it's three short, three long, three short, or three long, three short, three long. We shall see. As the gleaming boat lowered rescue nets and powered towards the raft, Kate pointed to the name painted on its bows. On its bows. Arthur gasped. It was the flying fish. They began climbing up. And Arthur glanced at his watch. There was no time to lose. At last Arthur pulled himself up and over the guardrail. As soon as his feet touched the deck, he looked around for the captain, then raced towards him. The captain backed away, looking worried as Arthur began telling him about the pirates. The captain listened kindly, then led Arthur and the twins out of the sun. He took them below decks, past cameras and thick steel doors. Why was there so much security? Kate asked the captain, who unlocked a door and showed them into a room. It was packed full of gold, jewels and treasure. Arthur and the twins gasped. These art treasures belong to world-famous museums. We are shipping them to... The captain began when he was suddenly interrupted by a shout from above. Raft ahoy! The action agents were hard on the heels of the captain as he raced up to the bridge, picked up his telescope and trained it on a floating speck. More shipwrecked victims, the captain muttered, probably hit by the water spout. Stop engines, stand by to pick them up. Arthur peered through the telescope and stared closely at the shipwrecked sailors on the raft. Suddenly, he noticed some things were very wrong. Don't stop, he yelled frantically. It's a trap. What has Arthur noticed? That kind of looks like maybe gun and things poking out of there. And that looks sketchy. So, the guns, something, looks like a security camera, 
Um, I'm sure the pitas probably look the same as some of the pitas he saw before. There are no, there, this guy. This guy as well. There you go. And there's the pedestal. In the nick of time, the captain ordered full steam ahead and swerved his ship past the fake survivors. Hooray, shouted Kate, but she was cut short by Sleuth's warning bark. The sea frothed and churned as a submarine surface beside the furious pirates. They abandoned their swamp draft and scrambled aboard the menacing craft. Torpedo, screamed Jim, coming straight for us. The, ca the captain flicked the engine to full throttle, but the torpedo was still on collision course. Jim braced himself for the inevitable explosion, just as the ship, just as the ship, accelerated and lifted itself out of the water. Their torpedo, the torpedo passed harmlessly underneath. Jim opened his eyes in amazement. They were aboard a hydrofoil. The captain took evasive action and set a course for the shallow water and safety of the Roba Roba Islands. Kate shouted warnings as they zigzagged to avoid torpedoes. Torpedoes to port and storm. As they raced for the islands, Arthur ran into the bridge and frantically tried to radio for help, but it was no good. His messages were being jammed. Then Sleuth growled angrily. Arthur looked up and gasped in horror. The pirate ship was right beside them. Arthur spotted Eye Patch Lil snarling as she prepared to fire the cannons. All hands on deck, yelled Kate. Stand by to repel boarders. Arthur reached the prow. He saw the Roga Roga Islands ahead, and more ships speeding in from starboard. They were trapped. Arthur recognised a figure on one of the board boats. It was Captain Tar, so he was a pirate too. Arthur thought back to the message he had found aboard the Flounder. Then he remembered Agency Memo 522. Maybe it would be alright after the, after all. Oh, the black and red flags. They're not trapped. As the Marine Detachment of Action Agents sped towards the pirates, Captain Tar leapt aboard the flying fish, grinning happily and shouting hellos. Who knew the plural of hellos, or of hello, had an E in it? Captain Tar, how did you? began Jim, but he broke off as the boat swung around and headed for the pirates, who had turned tail and scattered over the sea. The villains tried to sail for safety, but they were no match for the action agents. The flying fish sped over the waves and rammed the pirate's flagship. Action agents began to round up waterlogged villains. Arthur studied each of the captured pirates, but there was no sign of Max or Lil. Just then, Sleuth growled a warning. Arthur spotted some boats escaping in different directions. Max and Lil must be in one of those boats, shouted Kate. The other agents had their hands full. It was up to Arthur to give chase. He stared at the boats and remembered something remembered decoding something about an escape plan. Follow me, Arthur yelled, jumping on a handy jet ski. I know which boat they are in, which is Max and Lil's boat. Oh, the one that says JFX or JPX on it, that one. Or is it JXP? Oh, that one looks more like that. It was on the... here. JPX. the end. Arthur followed the escaping villains. Up ahead he spotted a familiar looking island and gasped. This was where he and the twins were first marooned. Arthur jumped off his jet ski. He, printed, he sprinted up the beach then stopped in amazement. Max and Lil were swinging in a large net. Who had caught them? Uncle Jake. Just then a tall figure strode out of the jungle. Sleuth wagged his tail happily. Uncle Jake, gasped Arthur. Congratulations, he boomed. Operation Skull and Crossbones has been a great success. Now you must find where those pirates buried their ill-gotten gains. The captured villains shouted out defiantly. Sleuth barked and tugged at Arthur's pocket. Arthur pulled out a scrap of blue paper. The qu twins recognised it as Arthur decoded it. We all know where the we know where the loot is. They all yelled. Come on. Where is the treasure buried? Under snake rock or something. 
removal. Just need to start there. From Buccaneer Beach, head for Skull Rock. Then go east through the jungle to Golden Beach Buddy Loot, six feet under the Eagle Rock. Eagle Rock, not Snake Rock. So that looks like it might be the shape of an eagle. There you go, six feet under Eagle Rock. So, oops. Here are the answers. I got this one. I got this one. Arthur and the twins are here. Okay, I thought they were there. Oh, they were going that way. I thought they were here and coming this way. I knew they were near the... They'd gone around here. What do they... Yeah, the trail of footprints. Spot a rock with a skull shape carved into it. This must be skull rock where they can pick up the trail. Oh. Yeah, see, that was that. Oh, the letter I inserted after every three letters. I just stopped reading I. That's it together. That, I'm pretty sure, is the route I took. Surprisingly. He unfolds a newspaper and slides it through the large gap under the door. Pushes the crate out of the lock with a screwdriver. Aha, that's what I thought. Arthur spots several modern details that prove the galleon is a fake ghost ship. Yeah, I noticed that one of the people had a radio. Oh, like a torch. What else is there? 7271. A torch. A light. He has a radio. Another light. There's like a radio. Yeah. I mean, you can get a ghost ship from like two years ago. They might have all those things. Oh yeah, third eye of the tall green straight hand guard. Oh, we sort of figured this one out. Oh, I was, I was close. I had it here, not here. The flying fish will be attacked in this area. So the message. Spider. island in the Diamond Archipelago. Then it will cruise due south between Shark Island and Volcano and out of our territory if an emergency occurs use escape plan JPX. Flying fish will be attacked here. I said here but it was on the line rather than on it. Arthur works it out by plotting the course of the flying fish on the 3D map. The route of the flying fish is marked in red. Arthur then listens to the instructions that Eyepatch Lil shouts to the pirate. He realises that the killer whale must be the name of the ship that will attack the flying fish. The attack course is given in the form of coordinates. Yeah. That's the numbers where the two routes coincide is where the flying fish will be attacked. The route up to the deck is marked in black. So we went out there, up, through the door. Climbed up through the hole, through the door, down, down, through there, up. Yep, that's the way I went. Okay, Arthur knows that he only has six hours. Oh, we got this one. Fifteen knots. Exactly six hours time. He can use the mirror. The signals are on beat 56. So, it's either short, short, long or long, long, short. either three Hold on. Where are we? Fifty six. No, it's not on fifty six. Page fifty six. Here, fifty four. Three short, three long, three short. Can't remember which one I said originally. Okay. 
And the last one. I'm surprised at how well I have done, however, I have had a couple of clues. Arthur recognizes these two men. Yep. Oh, I recognize this guy as well. He also notices concealed weapons, a hidden radio. Ah, that's what it was. And a periscope. These are all ringed black. Yeah, I thought those were barrels of a gun. I don't know what that is up there. It's a periscope. Oh, yeah. Black and red identification flag, so that's why he knows that they're safe. JPX, that's the name of the boat. Under the Eagle Rock. Well, I am thoroughly exhausted, <laughs> mentally and vocally. So, I really enjoyed it though, but I think I preferred the first one. I think I found the first one a bit easier, so. But I quite enjoyed that I had to do two of these this time. That was quite, quite fun. But anyway, if you are sleeping, I hope you sleep well. If you are not, thank you for staying awake with me. And let me know if you want to see some more. Let me know any comments, criticisms that you have on this video or any others. I'm always willing to read them. I may not like them, but I am willing to read them. Anyway, good night.